So let's start the class by answering the question, what is responsive design? Because when I work with a new team or a new client, that's one of the first questions I get. Because everyone's incredibly excited about that phrase, responsive web design. But everyone tends to have a slightly different idea about what it means for them and for their company. So I'd like to start today by telling you some of what it means for me as a designer. And to do that, I'd like to tell you a story about a tree. But this is a rather special tree, and it's located in the heart of the Pando Forest, which is in Utah. Now, Pando is a rather special forest. It's some 100 acres in size. And so let's say you and I are traveling side by side through this forest, and as we do so, we are surrounded by some incredible nature. This beautiful white tree trunks shooting up out of the ground all around us as far as the eye can see. And after some time traveling through this forest, I turn to you, and I say that I've lied to you, but just a little bit. Because you see, Pando is not actually a forest. Pando is just one tree. You see, Pando is actually the Latin term for eye spread. Pando is what's known as a clonal colony. It's one single giant quaking aspen tree. So each tree that you and I might see with our eyes is actually just one stem, and every single one of them shooting up out of this massive underground root system that they all share. And there are some 40,000 stems estimated to be in Pando today. Now, Pando is actually quite an old, old tree. It's some 80,000 years in age, which basically makes Pando one of the largest and one of the oldest known organisms alive on the planet today. And I think this is a really wonderful story to start with because I think as designers, or maybe as human beings, we tend to look at things that seem visually complex. And it's our instinct to sort of see them as more distinct and more separate than they actually are by default. And I've been thinking about that a lot in my own design practice, usually when I'm looking at a different forest entirely, which all the different devices and browsers that I'm being asked to deliver a beautiful and compelling experience to. And that's a more complex forest than I've ever had to deal with when designing for the web. But the thing is, is that when we're designing for the modern web, this is just table stakes. The web is anywhere and everywhere that our users happen to be with whatever screens happen to be closest at hand. So at least for me, it's critical to understand the web as a completely flexible design medium. In other words, when we're designing for the web, we're designing for a complete, infinite canvas. It's a completely flexible canvas, and our designs have to be as flexible and as accessible as the devices are that our users are holding in their hands. Now, what's exciting for me as a responsive designer is that there's so much excellent responsive design work out there on the web today that I can draw inspiration from. I'm sure you've found so many wonderful responsive sites out there, but let me show you a few examples that I really like today. And the exciting thing I think about responsive design as it's happening today is that there is really great responsive work being done across different industries. Here's Amherst College, which is a really great example of a responsive higher ed site. And it's beautiful and it's impactful on pretty much any size screen. And you notice that as I'm resizing the browser window, the responsive design is changing its shape to make it accessible to screens both small and large. Publishers, too, have been using responsive design really effectively over the last few years. Here's the Financial Times, which has a very stately and very beautiful responsive layout. They're using flexible grids, flexible images, and media queries to create a really beautiful responsive experience. But it's not just about publishers or higher ed websites. There are a number of web applications out there that have been using responsive design very effectively as well. Here's Adobe Typekit. And they have a very complex interface that you can use on screens small and large to not just um, browse fonts, but also filter them in, uh, along a number of really complex axes. The reason so many of these organizations and companies have gone responsive is because they recognize the fact that being device agnostic is just table stakes for designing for the modern web. We're designing for so much more than just desktop devices. Mobile computing has exploded in recent years. There are some 8 billion mobile devices estimated to be in use worldwide, and that number doesn't seem to be going down anytime soon. And tablet computing isn't necessarily the newest kid on the block anymore. But it still floors me that in 2011 alone, some 80 new tablet devices entered the marketplace in one 12-month period. That seems wild to me. And so with all the churn that we're seeing in both mobile and tablet computing, there's an understandable amount of investment and experimentation in trying to understand what the next post-desktop context might be. So there's a considerable amount of investment happening in smart TVs and smart watches and so many new different screen contexts that actually have really powerful browsers on them as well. 
And how many of these are we going to be designing for in the future? Now, when we're looking at a complex marketplace like this, it's very tempting to say that we should be de designing mobile-specific experiences or tablet-specific experiences or desktop-specific experiences. But actually, it's much more powerful and much more freeing if we stop designing for individual devices and instead think a little bit more flexibly. Think about delivering one experience that can be viewed on any size screen because ultimately, we're not just designing for devices, we're designing for the people on the other sides of those screens. Think about a reader of your website who might be coming back to that website at multiple points in the day with whatever device or devices happen to be closest at hand. This is something that a lot of publishers and organizations have actually realized, that by being a little bit more flexible and not trying to control the experience as much across different devices, they can actually drive and improve engagement across all those devices by being a little bit more device agnostic in how they design for the web. Ultimately, responsive design means that you're designing one flexible experience that's delivered to every device that might visit that website. Now that experience might change in its layout or its presentation depending on the size of the screen, but that's okay. Because ultimately it's one website that you're delivering to all of your users. And in doing so, that's gonna help you reach more devices and more people than ever before. So these are just some of the things that were cycling through my head when I first wrote that article called Responsive Web Design. This is an article that was published back in 2010, which is basically saying that the flexibility that's inherent in the web is something that we need to see as a strength rather than something that we need to try to control or limit. Now in the article, I put forward this sort of high level recipe for what makes a responsive design. Specifically that every responsive design begins with a fluid or flexible grid-based layout a layout that's built with percentages and proportions rather than inflexible pixels. And then there are images and media that are flexible themselves that work within those uh, flexible layouts. And finally, we have media queries, which are a little bit of pixie dust from the CSS specification. And they allow us to control the flexibility in ways that are useful to us. We can change and adapt those fluid layouts at different breakpoints. In other words, creating layouts that can change their shape and represent information in other words, they can respond to the changing shape of a browser window or of a device's display. So that all sounds very technical, but ultimately it's important to recognize that a responsive layout at the end of the day is just flexible in nature, but then it changes and adapts at certain breakpoints to make it accessible to screens narrow and wide. In this course, we're going to be looking at the sample design for a fictitious magazine, one that was created by, for, and about dinosaurs. Now, the sample files for that design are gonna be accessible in the resources section for this course. If you'd like to follow along, please do. But this design is what we're going to use to actually show you how those three ingredients from a responsive design snap together. So we'll be using fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries to translate this design into a completely flexible, completely responsive design. And we'll also look at some strategies to change our design process so that you can be a more flexible designer or developer yourself. And with that, Let's get started. <music>